There's an old legend that tells of a Portugal Portuguese monastery. It stood precariously on a 300 on the top of a 300 foot cliff. And visitors were strapped into a wicker basket, then pulled to the top with an old ragged rope. <laughs> Some of you recognize this story from George Vanderman, right? As one visitor was being strapped into the basket for the descent, he asked anxiously, how often do you get a new rope? And the monk calmly replied, when the old one breaks. <laughs> Risky? Yeah. Even dangerous, right? Like hurtling through life on a threadbare rope. <laughs> do we do that? Maybe we have a tendency to do that. Maybe, some, maybe we've been that way in our past, right? Ready to break. Skidding along, rubbing along the sharp rocks and bushes, getting by with the aid of as much caffeine and other stimulants as we can take. Too much food, wrong kind of food at one meal. Too much wound up nervous energy. Too little sleep. Too, much, too little relaxation. Tench parchment faces of individuals who cannot decide whether to take a Benzedrine and go to a party or take a second all and go to bed. This is our society. This is the world in which we have been called to witness. Wow. This is how people live. And with many, the rope is threadbare, almost ready to break. In this fast-paced, hurry-scurvy, atomic age of jet speed, even space, many take too little time to live sanely and easily and safely. We speed down the highway of life until our health, health is gone. Too late, we learn that when the rope breaks, we can't replace it. The Creator gave us only how many ropes? Just one rope. Now, everybody knows that someday the rope will break. We all are, have that incurable disease, right, of age. Everyone's rope breaks sometime. And really, we're in the miserable business of burying one another, right? But the question is, did it have to break so soon? Well, somebody glibly says, it doesn't matter which seat you sit in on an, on an airliner. You can argue, what's the safest place on an airliner? Is it right over the wing, right next to the exit door? Or is it the very back seat in the airplane? Um, but in the final end, someone will ultimately say, oh, it doesn't matter. Well, you have to die sometime, right? I've heard people say that. And um, when my time is up, when my number comes up, and you've all heard, heard people say that, and I've heard people say that, somehow I've never been completely satisfied with that response. Unfortunately, many people extend that philosophy to every area of life. It doesn't matter where you sit, doesn't matter how you eat or drink, and when the rope is supposed to break, it'll break and I fly away. Let me ask you, why do life insurance company re companies regard various lifestyles as better than another one? Um, and uh, the risk of longevity. You know, rates are based upon that those factors that have to do with lifestyle. Uh, why do those who exercise have fewer heart attacks and, those, and, and thus live longer? Maybe it's not some mystical number that controls our fate after all. Maybe it's not the stars. Maybe it doesn't matter where we sit. If we sit too long at the dinner table or lounge too long in the favorite chair when we should walk, walk, walk. Went to Weimar one time and they talked about walk, walk, walk. Walk, walk, walk. We heard that again and again, right? <clears throat> We're planting a garden. Maybe it's really possible to postpone that day 
when the rope will break. Now, having said all of this, we all recognize that there are some outside things that control when the rope breaks, like accidents, for instance. There are some congenital defects, inherited health problems that, that, that many have. And when science goes as far as it can, when all human help fails, we remember a reading about a woman 2,000 years ago who passed through the crowd, touched the hem of the healer's garment. What a lesson in faith as she joins herself to the healing virtue of the Savior, the breath of life, if you will. Does God still heal? Is it different now than it was in the first century? Can it be that the healer is still near enough that we moderns can touch the hem of his garment also and live? And I believe so. I believe that's true. I've heard some of these kinds of miracles recently. Listen to this. James chapter 5. You all kind of probably know what this is about. James the fifth chapter. James is that little book right after Hebrews. James chapter 5. Verses 14 and 15. James 5, 14 and 15. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall do what? Save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he had committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And uh, it goes on. It talks about Elijah. When Elijah prayed, what, what happened? There was no rain for three and a half years. Actually, this passage in James about Elijah, the only place that you'll find in the Bible, you know, I searched 1 Kings 18 and, and, and those set chapters to see where it said, well, three and a half years would uh, there be no rain. It doesn't say that in 1 Kings. But it does in James 5. That's where we get it. A lot of times we get things from another text in the Bible, comparing te uh, spiritual things with spiritual things, right? Comparing text with text. So this is God's way. I've seen God honor these words, and uh, sometimes quickly, sometimes positively. He always answers. Doesn't he always answer? Okay. And there is something we need to understand. God wants us to be in health. Notice with me 3 John, verse 2. 3 John is the little book just before Revelation, one of, the, one of the little books just before Revelation. 3 John is a one-chapter book, and verse 2. 3 John is an interesting letter. John uh, tells in this little chapter how he went to a church, certain church one day, and they wouldn't let him in. Can you imagine that? <laughs> they wouldn't let John the Apostle into that church. <laughs> you can read about that in this chapter. But notice what he says at the beginning. Beloved, don't you like that? Who's he talking to here? Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. What an idea. God is not the originator of disease, suffering, and death. God is the author of laws that, when violated, can big trouble. You know, I sometimes have been precariously on a, on a roof. I was at Loma Linda one time washing windows in the library, and it's way up high. And a little hook kind of goes over the edge, and, and uh, you know, and standing on a kind of an uncertain platform. And, uh, you know, wondering what would happen if, if the rope broke. <laughs> Gravity takes over, right? There are laws that govern. They are design laws, actually. Um, we're designed in a certain way. We don't think about throwing sugar in our gas tank, right? What happens if you do that? Everything freezes up, right? So um, God is the author of laws that when violated bring trouble, trouble and pain because they separate us from the laws of the life giver. But these bodies of ours are very, very sensitive and obedient to cause and effect. Very obedient. 
Galatians 6, verse 7. Galatians 6, verse 7. Galatians, that little book, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, right after Thessalonians. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also what? Reap. Cause and effect here. This truth works with mathematical precision. But God allows us to experiment if we must. He doesn't force our wills. Aren't you glad he does that? He gives us, we're not robots, are we? He allows us to experiment. For example, our prisons and hospitals are filled with evidence of drug use and alcohol use. People that have gone a little bit too far with it. Medical science knows that smoking is linked to lung cancer and heart disease. God does not have any, have a, God does not have an angel stationed nearby to blow out the match. It's proven that overeating can contribute to a heart attack, but God does not push us back from the table. And the time may come when a nurse may have to mark his or her menu. In a, in a controlled environment. My, I would hate to have that happen, wouldn't you? God may never limit our, God never limits our activity in this area. God places the facts before us and he says to us, look and live, look and live. I would ask this, why should God give a person a new rope when that person is doing the best to wear the old one out? In reality, God plans for restoration. It includes much more than miracle healing. It includes teaching us how to live. Much more than healing. You no, know, we could have pray for people, and, uh, but really he wants us also to learn how to live, right? How to live healthily. I'd call your attention to a cooking school that's gonna be held in this, in this uh, building right across the parking lot. What is the date for the first one? August 10, I think it's from 5.30 to 7.30, right? <laughs> uh, a lot of people, I think, are already thinking about going, but uh, if you didn't know about that, that's gonna be a very important uh, outreach to this church, uh, a vegetarian cooking school. And uh, so I just wanted to call your attention to that. Come and learn all you can. Never was this healing was Jesus' healing separated from his teaching? He always healed and he taught. These went side by side. There's a close relationship between our body's health and our spiritual health, right? Learning how to, how to care for our bodies is a lifelong pursuit. Now let's notice. God does heal in 2021. You believe that? Say amen if you believe that. Amen. Okay. You know, I'm healed every day. I go to bed at night and sometimes I'm very tired, right? Especially when I'm walking around the gym all day. <clears throat> and uh, the knee that's been repaired had to be repaired because of some injudicious thing I did years ago, right? The rope rubbing across some ragged rocks. But we must keep in mind that there's a counterfeit at work also. Satan is jealous of the great healer. He likes, he like Absalom, stands at the gate trying to gain people to his side, right? And uh, tries to make points with people. Let's look together at Mark chapter 31, verse 13, verse 22. Mark 13, verse 22. Mark 13, verse 22. The devil is an Absalom in the gate. Mark 13, verse 22. False Christs and false prophets shall arise. They shall sow signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, who? The very elect. We're going to need to be careful in the days that follow where we go for our healing. Uh, 
God places the facts before us. He says, look and live. I would ask the question, why should God give us a new role? Before Jesus comes, counterfeit miracles will be performed in the name of religion. And uh, that could deceive the very elect. I have no, uh, no doubt in my mind that these healings may indeed bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. One of our spiritual gifts is the gift of healing. Let's look at this list of gifts. I, I love this one because it has some in that the other lists don't have. One in Ephesians 4 doesn't have this one. But this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Notice some of these gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. It says, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily, what does it say? Prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. What did I just read? Miracles. miracles. Then gifts of healings and helps, governments, diversities, and tongues. Does anybody here have the gift of help? I know people in this church that have the great gift of helps, right? That list isn't, that isn't in some of the other lists. But he says here that there will be miracles. One of the gifts of the church, gifts of the spirit. If we could turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, there's an interesting little idea here in um, those first verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It says uh, verse uh, 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 and 7. We just read a list of gifts, right? Gifts of the Holy Spirit is given to the church. Then it says, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in what is the next word? No gift. Waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So guess what? There will be the gift of miracles in the end time. Signs and wonders will follow the believers, right? But before that time comes, there's going to be a tremendous counterfeit. A false revival will sweep the country, literally sweep the world. And we need to be careful where we get our healing from. And uh, as we read, there will be false Christs, false prophets all over the place who will say, this is the way, walk in it. So miracle healings, it's not just for this first century. The devil who is responsible for much of the sin, sin and sickness in the world is a great counterfeit worker. Let's look now next at Revelation chapter 13. This is a chapter that we have, we have often read. Revelation chapter 13, verses 12 to 15. Revelation 13, 12 to 15. It says, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, talking about the beast with the lamb-like horns. And causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the beast, worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those what? Miracles. Which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would, as many as would not worship the, the, the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive what? A mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. What causes the mark to be urged upon people? A bunch of lies, right? False prophets. Uh, deceivers in many places. That's an end time idea. Notice also with me Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Matthew 7. Start with verse 21. 
Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, what day is he talking about here? <laughs> Whenever the prophet uses that expression, in that day, <laughs> he's really talking about the day that we're living in, right? The end time day. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, in your name cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works? Then, and then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Some of the deceptions of the end times we're going to see with our very own eyes. In fact, the deceptions will be so great and so acute that we won't be able to believe the evidence of our senses. These are Christians. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. How do I know they're Christians? They're saying, Lord, Lord. They are giving God the credit for the, for the, for the miracles that they have wrought and uh, the deceptions that they have brought to the earth. Many will say to me in that day, we have done many wonderful things. They give God the credit for a counterfeit. Evidently, many who will appear to be healed by a power other than the power of Christ. I certainly don't want to be healed by anything except the power of Christ. Do you? Amen. Jesus spends us some time with this chapter. It's wonderful to read. If it's not Christ, then whose name are they healed in? Therein is the subtle deception, for not all miracles are from God. How are to we, we to keep from being deceived? And I have a number of different ideas here that I want to run past you. Here are some of them. Number one, the one who's doing the healing. Does the healer demand healing from God? Does he command a person to be healed? That's something that you want to look at very carefully. Number two, or does he say, thy will be done? Jesus set the example for that in Gethsemane. I heard Wayne say this morning, his hands clenching into the dirt, right? He's going through terrible uh, turmoil in his mind because of the guilt of the sins of the world. And he says in Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. Number two, does he exalt Christ as the great physician, or does he make God a sort of a publicity agent to further his own personal fame and finance? You can quickly determine this. especially if it's associated with a begathon for money. Watched for those things. Thirdly, does the healer teach and espouse the word of God as he preaches to thousands? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because what? There's no light in them. That's verse 20 of, of Isaiah chapter 8. But verse 19 is a very, very insightful idea because it's talking about spiritualism. Spiritualism, what is spiritualism? It's the power of the devil, isn't it? Causing people to be deceived. A number of different things that we could think about here. The healer. Is he living to the law and testimony? What about the Sabbath in this, in this, in this, in this regard? Or the state of the dead? Or the manner of Christ's coming? Or the idea about origins? What does he say about the first nine chapters of Genesis? I'm talking about a healer here, somebody that might perform a miracle in your eyes. What does he say about Christ's righteousness? Or the 2300 days? Or all these things that are so important, such important teachings in the scripture, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, is because what? No light in them. Does the healer tell those who have come to be healed that their illnesses may come as a result of disregarding the, the laws of health? Wrecking the rope prematurely. Does he teach them how to cooperate with the laws in the future? after he's been healed. That's an important idea. Number five, does the healer tell his people about 
the healing power, the healing power of sunlight and pure water. As you hold a cooking school, showing people a better way. Skillfully used, water skillfully used inside and outside the body. Six, does he tell about rest and diet and temperance? Whole plant feed foods eaten whole. By the way, what is his experience? Does he talk about fresh air? God's air conditioning system for body and mind and exercise. You know, with healings, there needs to be some kind of an educational process go along with it, right? Number eight, does he tell them that their body is the temple of God for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and that it should be reverently cared for as a holy temple for God's presence? By the way, the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, right? He's one member of the Godhead. And our bodies are designed for the habitation of the Holy Spirit, right? I uh, direct you to three passages in 1 Corinthians. You know, when you read the letters by, of Paul, you get the idea that, wow, he's honing in on something here that that church needs, right? I have an idea that there was a lot of raucous living in, in Corinth, even among the church members. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Second Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 6. It, it, it's easy to remember. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 6, <laughs> 19 and 20. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, 18 and 19. These passages all talk about the Spirit of God wanting to dwell in our soul temples. And 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Let's look at that one. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. I think we're going to get done on time today. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. I just love this text. This is an, a useful text that uh, you can use when you're giving Bible studies and you're talking about a subject like this. It says, whether therefore you eat or drink, or what does it say next? Whatsoever you do, okay? Do all to the glory of God. Uh, the first angel says, fear God and do what? Give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And you know, we're living in the time of the judgment, of, the judgment hour versus history. And so he says, whatever you do, do it all to what? Glory of God. Give God glory. Now, I also believe that has a much more expanded meaning than that. Giving God glory is about, is about righteousness by faith, right? We give him the glory. He's the one who does the work. He's the one that provides the horsepower for a Christian life, right? So these things are, are important in our understanding of giving God glory in the first angel's message. Does he take the time to uplift Jesus as Savior and Lord and friend who has graciously given to us life every day we breathe? True healing should be Christ-centered. For he is the one from whom all blessings flow, who from all blessings flow. Counterfeit healing only deals with the momentary need of people, but does not teach health principles. True healing is accompanied by health principles clearly taught in the Bible. I'd like to recommend Ministry of Healing as a book to get and read. I don't know how many of you have the little book Ministry of Healing. Okay, not too many. You know, if there were enough, we would order a group, a bunch of them, and just bring them here to the church. But on this subject, this is probably the best that I've seen. Paul Harvey talked about ministry of healing. Did you know that? Paul Harvey, his wife was an Adventist, and he attended church in uh, Phoenix himself. He's been gone now about 10 years, I think. He talked about ministry of healing as being, and he mentioned several health professionals who, who were experts in their field who recommended this book. It's a wonderful book, written way ahead of its time, Ministry of Healing. If you'd like to have a copy of that, see me or see one of the elders. If we have enough of them, we'll order them. We'll order a group of them. 
So true healing is accompanied by health principles clearly taught in the Bible. I like to recommend ministry healing. The counterfeit one teaches disobedience. He's the lawless one. True religion comes from love in the heart, doesn't it? Holy Spirit, the one who inhabits our soul temple, also gives us love. Romans 5.5. 5. So uh, the Bible says, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Do you think that refers to the laws of health as well? I think it does. Jesus told one person, go and do what? Sin no more. The healing of the body is analogous to take up your bed and walk. That's what the healing of the body is. The healing of the soul accompanies it. Your sins be forgiven you. And who can say which is the greatest miracle? Third John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that you may be in health, prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Physical health and a trust in God are the two elements that bring health to our bodies. Spend some time every day searching the word of God. When you get up in the morning, give yourself to him in the morning. Make that your very first work. Pray for the Holy Spirit to plant love in your heart, love for people, and a love for God himself, who is the source of all blessing. Both health of God, of body and soul require the creative power of God in a willing heart. That's how healing comes. Creative power in a willing heart. Please know that God hears every sincere prayer for healing. Yes, Jesus cares. He answers in the way his divine providence sees fit. We don't know the providence of God, do we, when we, when, we, when we pray? Many times we don't even know what to pray for as we ought. But that's why we need to pray for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and teaches us to pray and uh, takes our prayers and perfumes them with the incense of Christ's righteousness as they ascend to the Father. By the way, who are our prayers directed to? Our Father, which art in heaven, right? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. <laughs> you know, what Jesus is asking us to pray for here is a, for fulfillment of Daniel 2. Your kingdom come. A kingdom that fills the whole earth with God's, God's goodness. We do not use the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit does what? Uses us. That's why he inhabits our mind if we allow him to come in. He uses us in a way consistent with love and compassion. He loves to hear the human, he loves to he hear of the humility of a human heart who confesses, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. God never says no. This request for mercy, God always is just and merciful. If we doubt that, it shows that we, do not, we need to know him better. What love in the gospel? The gospel is designed to make man whole. That we not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16, that chapter is the 1,000th chapter in the Bible. Did you know that? I've mentioned that several times in Bible studies. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believeth in him should not, what? Perish, Perish but have everlasting life. That's chapter 1,000 in the Bible. Isn't that neat? Probably a, probably a coincidence. By some coincidence, this chapter in God's holy book talks about the love of God for each one of us. He wants us to be in health, and prosper even as our soul prospers. This is God's plan for your life and for my life. Let's cooperate. Let's make this the beginning of a new day and cooperate with him. Learn how to take care of our bodies and uh, spend some time every day in God's holy word so that we can know him better. Actually, that's the reason we should study the Bible, right? Uh, the Bible is not some kind of a theological textbook or, or some kind of a theological encyclopedia. But the Bible is the word of God. 
and his desire for us to be made whole. We can all have a new day. This, this can be the first day of the rest of our lives, right? Learn all you can about healthful living. This is God's plan for your life and mine. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful that you are and that you are a rewarder of all those who diligently seek you. This morning we come to you, Lord, with, with hearts that uh, need your presence every moment of every day. We're thankful for the breath that you bring to us every day and the privilege of just being alive and looking forward to your coming. I pray that you'll be with each one here this morning, Lord, in very special ways. All these folks that are in this church this morning are your friends. And Lord, we want to know more about you. We want to know about your ways. That we might have healthful lives. That we might redeem the years that the locust has eaten. And look forward to a new day. Please hasten the day when you'll come. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.